last time we left off dealing with chapter 20 on Sunday in uh, noting the relationship between Jonathan and David and also recognizing the relationship between Michal and, uh, and uh, David, that Michal is one of the uh, children of uh, Saul, a daughter, and uh, married to David, and that was the first wife that David took, was Michal. Now, how is it that their relationship with David is something that's special, even to the point of them favoring David and acting against their own father? What happened there? On the case of Jonathan and David first, why was there a bond developed? Go ahead. They both had great faith in God. All right. How was that demonstrated? In their battle exploits. Okay. Both of them put their lives on the line because they trusted in God and served Him in that way. How about Michal? Okay. Let him down uh, out the, the window to be one who uh, it was able to escape uh, in that uh, in that time, so that he would not be found. And uh, what David wanted to do, obviously, was kill him. He had been trying to do that repeatedly. And so you have both of these, Jonathan and Michal, who show their favor towards David and uh, act in a way that's really against their father because they recognize their father is doing that, which was wrong. And that's the backdrop here as we start this evening. In chapter 21, you notice the area that we're dealing with here. It talks about them being at Nob. Ramah was the place that was there of, uh, of uh, Saul, Gebi, or, I mean, uh, of uh, Samuel. Gibeah of Saul there. David, his hometown was Bethlehem. Jebus, as it's called right now, still under the control of the Jebusites. Later on will be Jerusalem, the capital. And then Shiloh up here where the, uh, the tabernacle is supposed to be. That's where most of the priests uh, were centered at that time in Gilgal just across in the first encampment as the people had come into the land, that continued to be a uh, very important city. Tell me what happens. Chapter 21, where do we open it up? David came to Nob, all right. And as he was at Nob, what happened? Okay. Have somebody ask, why are you alone? Why have you come alone? You're the king's emissary, is the idea. And what does he say? Okay, he's out on a uh, secret mission, king, uh, confidential mission. Doesn't want him to tell anybody. Is that true? Is that justified then? Why do we hear about that story? Why did we see that? Okay. This is not something that is pointed out like many stories. They'll change the hero uh, to be always doing what's right or something else to look more favorable or to excuse. In this lesson, you're going to notice several times, uh, David shown warts and all. Uh, as to what he did. It's uh, recognized that when he does wrong, it's admitted that is there. And so here is this lie that's told. And why did he not want to really say what he was doing? All right, he's trying to stay away from uh, Saul and stay away from that anger. That presents him with a problem, trying to get around just kind of quietly and uh, everything, and that is that he doesn't have anything to eat, right? So what does he want? 
I want bread. Five of the loaves of bread had been asked for in that way. And what did the priest say? Do what? Okay. So what bread are we talking about? The holy bread. All right. There's the table of what is it called? Showbread. And that was one that had the, the bread upon it. Priest answers, uh, there's no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. That's as the King James puts it. Now, question. Where in the scripture does it say that someone who's not a priest could take of the bread as long as they've kept from women? Is that anywhere in the text? Well, why is that said? What does that tell us? Okay. All right. The priest is making a different way here, maybe a way that he can uh, come up with something different. Is that unusual in Israelite history to have uh, the priest changing the law? No, this is one time you find that, but this is not unusual. We're going to talk about a question here in a few minutes uh, on the, uh, here uh, very soon on uh, Matthew chapter 12 and the showbread, but I wanted to get into this first. Here you have a case where an exception is being pointed out that's not noted in Scripture. It's not being pointed out in Scripture. Another statement is made, well, I'm about to change out this bread so you can have the old bread. Is that what the law said about the disposition of the old bread? No. It was still for the priests. And there is no statement about that being something that would be there, and especially not uh, if you've kept yourself from women, then maybe you can have some of this bread. Now, when you look at it over in Matthew chapter 12, that's exactly the uh, uh, context that is involved. Matthew 12 and Matthew 15 fit together. Because you're talking about the traditions of men. And that's basically what we've got here is the development of a tradition. It's not noted in law. It's not given in law. But they change that law after their own kind of tradition. Uh, those who were around Jesus, the Pharisees, it says in verse 2, they saw his disciples going out into the grain field and plucking ears and eating them. Now... If you plucked an ear off of a, a stalk of grain and ate it, was that illegal? No. Wasn't anything illegal about that. That was eating of that. What would make it illegal? Do what? Okay, if you made a meal and you ground that, or what else? If you built a fire specifically, uh, the building of a fire would be that which would uh, be eating that on the Sabbath day. That would be unlawful for them to do on the Sabbath day. What else? If you took it for commerce, that would be unlawful. But just satisfying your hunger on the Sabbath day was nothing unlawful in and of itself. But the Pharisees had said it's not lawful for them to do that. Look at verse 3 of Matthew 12. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and ate the showbread, which it was what? Not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priest. That's going right straight back to the Old Testament law. Now, what's the point that is being made by Jesus? You're going to condemn my disciples for doing something what? 
that's against your tradition, but not against the law. But you're going to try to justify David doing something that was against the law. Because that was their way. They tried to make it sound as if David was doing uh, that which was acceptable in that way. Um, look at verse 5 then in Matthew 12, uh, going on further. Or, have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? What does that mean? They profane the Sabbath but they're guiltless. They are without sin in doing that. They're doing their work as priests. Okay. If anybody else did their work, their normal work, would that be okay on the Sabbath? Part of the work of the priest specifically was the building of that fire and the continuing, the stoking of that fire. Exodus makes it very clear that that was something that was totally unlawful in any way for an Israelite to do except for the priesthood. So here's your choice. There's something here that is not uh, unlawful. That's a double negative there. Something that's lawful to do, to eat of that grain. Now, which does that fit into? Does that fit into the case of David eating showbread which he said, no, that's unlawful to do. Or does it fit into what looks like it would be unlawful in the priest making the fire, doing the work on the Sabbath day, but yet while he does it, is he wrong in doing it? No. Why? It's been provided for by law. So Jesus gives them the alternative. Look at these two cases. Which place does it fit? Well, which place did them eating grain fit? All right. Fit for that which was lawful. It might have been something that looked like it could have been unlawful had they done that for commerce or whatever else that was involved. But in and of itself, it was not unlawful. It was lawful for them to do that. Now, how does Jesus get them to reason about that? On the basis of what? <clears throat> Tradition of man? Okay, on the basis of law. Scripture. That when you have the law, you go back to the law, which case is it? Which case does it fit under? And so that's what was trying to be done there. A lot of times I'll find people that take this passage and this and uh, uh, over in Matthew chapter 15, and they talk about it as if this is something that's a minor point. It doesn't really matter. You could have disregarded the law maybe for uh, some particular time of hardship or distress or emergency or something like that. Uh, I've been very careful in trying to approach things in that way, especially when the context makes it very clear how it is approached not approached from the idea that David was very hungry and uh, he could have gone out here and eaten so it would sustain him so he wouldn't die, that that somehow is, uh, is an exception that would be all right. That's not what it says. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, it just very clearly, it was not lawful for him or the people that were with him to eat it. Period. Go ahead. Seven, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What is that? The point that's being made there seems to be the idea they're looking at these men who are doing what's right and yet condemning them. And they ought to recognize, they ought to have mercy on whom God has mercy uh, rather than uh, just, you know, in their kind of a way of binding something on them. Uh, that mercy ought to be accepted that God had provided for that to happen. Go ahead, Priest is lying too, and uh, involved in something which was, was clearly unlawful to do. Go ahead. Not that it's a justification, but there seems to be uh, fear present <coughs> that priest when he sees David coming to him. He, he's fearful of that interaction, whether he thinks something's gone wrong with David or there's something uh, dangerous to him. There's, there's something. 
Sure, why would he be afraid of it? He's the son-in-law of the king, right? So if I say the son-in-law of the king, I know you're hungry, but I'm not going to give you anything. Uh, that might be a little bit of a problem from the standpoint of, of that. However, if the law told him, no, you can't give that, what should he have done? Should have stood up and done what was right and say, David, I'm sorry, all we have is the showbread. Let's, you know, let me point you somewhere else where maybe you can get something. Plus he mentions later to Saul about how blameless or righteous, I don't remember what the words were, so I think he may have been intimidated in the process. Correct, correct. And later on told Saul what he should have told Saul as well. All right, go ahead. So... I don't know that I could come up with one that would be uh, a matter there. Uh, you know, if someone thought that it was not lawful, uh, like, for instance, in the case of uh, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 8 through 10 there, not to eat the meat that was there, a sacrifice to an idol that they thought that was, in essence, a worshiping of the idol inherently. Paul said, no, there's nothing inherently in an idol. But if it was a matter of conscience to that person, they don't eat it. Uh, there isn't a matter where it was unlawful. It was lawful to do it. But we also were bound by our conscience as well on some things like that. That's not a parallel exactly or anything, but it's just saying here's a matter where they had condemned the disciples for eating the grain straight from the field. There wasn't any law that would uh, oppose that. That was fine to do. Uh, and yet they made that case where David, they wanted to argue the case of David being okay for doing what was clearly not lawful for him to do. You see what I mean? Yeah. There, there are two different things there. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, some people make the make the case, or, or at least present the case, that um, it's not such a bad thing for someone to steal food if they're starving to death. You know, there's that. You know, is it wrong or is it not wrong? Is it okay? Is it only a little bit wrong? <clears throat> and the scriptures have already dealt with that. Yeah. Proverbs very clearly points out that that's one of the things that you pray for, that you might not be so poor that you would sin and, and steal. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Anything else there on that one? Okay. So he's given this bread in that sort of way. What else does he need? All right, protection. He doesn't have a sword. And so what happened? Verse 8, David said to Ahimelech, Is there not here uh, on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapon with me, because the king's business required hate. So the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. And David said, there is none like it, give it to me. And so he takes that for his protection. Anything wrong with doing that? I know of a thing that would be wrong with that. Provided you can lift it. <laughs> That uh, he had been the one who had gotten it from Goliath because he killed him. But what's still a problem? Why am I without a sword? Still dishonest. Okay, still a dishonesty there. Uh, and that's a, a matter of a failure to tell the truth. 
And that's something that, uh, again, is, is just as wrong in this case as it was in the one before. All right. When you look at what happens next, you're going to go over here to Gap, from Nob over to Gap. What do you notice about Gap? It's a different color there and there, isn't it? All right, it's in the Philistine territory. So he's going to go over to Gath. He uh, goes to Achish, who is the king there in Gath. And uh, what does everybody bring up? Oh, I remember David. Go ahead. The songs are saying about David killing Philistines. Okay. That Saul had killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands of Philistines. And so now we've got this guy who they've sung about killing thousands and thousands of Philistines. What does that tend to make them want to do? Want to kill David. So what does David do? Do what? He acts like he has lost his mind. Okay. He feigns lunacy is the statement that is made uh, there, that uh, he acts like he's crazy, uh, out of his mind. Now, let me ask you something. What about that? Is that a lie? Do what? This is one of those that's always been one of the more difficult for me for dealing with this in the sense of is this making this something that is uh, acceptable. I still don't think it is, though. Uh, from the perspective I'll take with you, I've had people uh, make this and say he did not make a statement. Deception is also a form of dishonesty. And that's what takes place here is a deception. That, that. Now, does it save his life? Does that necessarily mean that what he did is right? There are statements where, and I've, I've kind of looked at it and tried to consider the, the concept of here he is, he's going through a feigning of a uh, situation of, uh, of uh, being out of his mind. Uh, someone said, well, what if you have an attack that presents a false front? and then pulls back. Is that not deceptive? Well, yeah, it is. But I don't have a problem with that since that's the point of the nature of warfare is that uh, that's what's involved. There's not a moral dilemma that seems to be there. Some have suggested that in this case you have much the same thing with the feigning of lunacy. I will admit that I have more of a question about that in this particular case. But I still will come down on the side of saying, no, I don't think it's right. Because in the end, you have him presenting himself in a overt, uh, uh, affirmative way of being something that he is not. And the intent of that being a point of deception. It seems to me that comes down to the idea of that's not a, a lawful thing to do. Somebody asked me one time, uh, I was in a class and talking about this, and it was no World War II veteran. And he said, boy, you'd have problems being in war if you've got a problem with trying to be subterfuge with things. And I said, yeah, I would. That's, that's one of those things of a reason of why I have uh, opted as a, one who's a conscientious objector. I don't like that uh, case in many ways. Many of you know I'm a World War II historian. Uh, there's a number of things I really appreciate about that. My own father was in it. But 
I can't do the justifying of what sometimes has to be done in warfare that uh, I think I would end up in a problem with regard to conscience. Here, very clear that David at least is trying to uh, present himself as something he is not. Go ahead, uh, DJ. Okay. Um, so can, can we assume here that if David from the beginning doesn't lie, God makes his path a lot easier? Because he obviously has to lie, lie, lie. But he had to survive all this stuff. So is it one of those things? Like, this is my question. So. Well, I can't assume something that is there, but what I can know is that it's not right. Uh, in some way, God provides for those who do his will. And uh, I can be assured of that, uh, at least, you know, from the standpoint of there. Now that you have something. Well, and then, then you have, and he's been anointed. So where's his faith in God? Right. About all of this. Yeah. Right. His faith is lacking where he is here. Yeah. And when he goes in and just has that faith in God, does what he's supposed to do, what's he able to do? Overcome multitudes by himself. Jonathan able to do the same thing. So uh, the point of the deliverance by many or few, as Jonathan has put it earlier, is something that was open to David <coughs> as well, but he didn't take in this particular study. Anybody else there? <laughs> All right. Go ahead. There's the deliverance by God that's made clear and, and uh, a, a testimony to that faith. Well, oftentimes in our own life, we tend to pray about the big things and then handle the little things ourselves. You know, and when he was fighting Goliath and taking 600 out and killing thousands or whatever, you know, he thought to stop and pray or whatever it might be but then when it's just the little things and he's thinking quick he's not turning to God for the right answers and a lot of times we don't either you know we we pray about the big things and think we can handle the little things on our own when we should be praying about those or consulting you know the word we'll come up a little bit look here a little bit about him consulting God more go ahead All right, anybody? Go ahead. I think it's interesting how we see even in David's life, he was turning uh, from Cedar's well houses, I think, uh, uh, when he was young and, and like you said, when he was thinking to play, you could almost say that he was brutally honest and very blunt about telling these leaders and the king that they're not a cause. Why have you not even addressed this? Something that he could have very easily been.
All right. Let's go into chapter 22 then. Uh, start out in a cave, and what uh, what next? What does he do in uh, trying to take care of his father and mother? Takes them over to what? Pardon me? Okay, King of Moab. Does that, uh, that strike any recall bells there from background history of David's family in Moab? Okay, all right. That's where you had been for a while during a time of uh, famine and gone over there and then come back from there. And so now he's going to go over and there's going to be uh, uh, leaving of his father and mother over here in Moab, uh, which had evidently had some bit of uh, uh, a kindness or uh, uh, goodwill that had developed there. Meantime, Saul comes along and he comes to the priest and he says, Hey, I heard you helped out David. And what happens there? All right, kills not only the priest, but how many of them? Okay, you have these men who are killed then as a result of that. How about that? Does that sound like it's a proper way to deal with the issue? Oh, yeah, God's anointed. David, I mean, uh, Saul shows one of the reasons why God had rejected him. Here, a case of him taking those priests and doing to them simply because of him acting in a way that uh, David didn't like it. The showbread wasn't brought up, nothing about anything like that. It was that uh, uh, he had been kind unto David. After this slaughter of the priests, there's one Abathar who comes to David He's holding that ephod that is there to show what? What does he tell them about? All the priests have been slaughtered. Okay. And so how is that received? Uh, David knew they were going to when when that was Doeg saw him when he met uh, met the priest, he said that yeah, I knew this was going to happen. All right. David starts to blame himself a little bit there, doesn't he? Justifiably or not? Go ahead. Whenever you do things, there's a lot of following, uh, uh, there's a lot of collateral <laughs> items, a lot of uh, ripples from, from actions that affect Did David do wrong in what he did at Nob? Sure. No doubt about that. Did David cause the death of the priests? No. There are two different issues there that you have to deal with. The fact that he did some things and some things came from that as an effect. And then this was a part of that. That doesn't suggest that what he did was cause the death that was there of those priests. What caused the death of the priest? It wasn't him eating bread or anything else. It was Saul killing him, making a decision that they had been good to, uh, or kind to David, and he was going to kill them. So we need to make a point. Yes, there was wrong, but no, that was not a matter in which David was the cause of all of that as he kind of starts to think about uh, that sense and wondering whether he's the cause he really has to go back and recognize what had taken place there. Anything else there in that one? Well, 
don't have a lot of time left, so I want to get into that last chapter. In chapter 23, look at the first five verses. Here is an example of the faith that ought to have been present when Israel was going into, into warfare. It says, then they told David, saying, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kilah, and they are robbing the threshing floor. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Kilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more, then, if we go to Kilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Kilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. What do we notice is good there? All right, he's asked, you need to go save these people from Keilah. And the first thing he does is what? Ask God. Then there are people that object. And so what does he do again? Ask God. Is this what I ought to do? Even over there, object, yes. And what does God do? Bless them. There's 100% of the time that happens. This is not something you'll ever find a, a case of an exception to. When God tells people to go out and do that which is there in warfare, in the Old Testament, and he gives them that charge, when they do it, they're blessed. When they don't, they aren't. When they go out in warfare and they don't ask God, what happens? they got a problem unless there's something that's justified that before of God approving it. But when God is asked, God blesses. He expects us to act under his direction with his authority, and when that happens, he blesses those who do so. Isn't that a simple point? But that's one that you get here as you start in chapter 23. All right. So David and his men, about 600, it says, arose, departed from Keilah. They went wherever they could. When it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up pursuit. He says, I'm not going to try anymore. David abode in the wilderness. In the stronghold, it says, and remained in the mountains of the wilderness of Zeph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. That's when you have Jonathan and David get together again, and the point be made that between our two households, here's this covenant that is renewed, not only between David and Jonathan, but between David and Jonathan's household. And what do we find? David was one who was taking refuge at En Gedi. En Gedi is, uh, if you look it up in your uh, uh, internet, you'll probably see some beautiful pictures. It's an oasis on the west side of the uh, Sea of, or the Dead Sea. The uh, things are sometimes called the Salt Sea. It is a place where it's just beautiful in many senses, and it's brought into an area where you have to come through like one or two people side by side. You can't get in there with a big force that's coming. So that's where he is at that stronghold and an ability to continue on there. There's wildlife there. There's water that's there. So you have this ability for him uh, to be sustained in that way. All right. Anything else we got there? Okay. Okay. Last three verses that are there from 1 Chronicles 12. And some of the sons of Benjamin and Judah came to David at the stronghold. David went out to meet them and answered and said to them, If you come peaceably to me to help me, my heart will be united uh, with you. But if to betray me to my enemies, since there is no wrong in my hands, may the God of our fathers look and bring judgment. Then the Spirit came upon Amasiah, the chief of the captains, and he said, 
We are yours, O David. We are on your side, O son of Jesse. Peace, peace to you, and peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. So David received them and made them captains of the troop. So you've got these people that come now uh, opposite of what Saul was like trying to be peaceable uh, to it. All right, and that takes place at En Gedi. Anything else? Okay. Go ahead. And did he come here there to <coughs> bid uh, the Benjamites and Judah? Did they come there to do that, or did the Spirit of the Lord change them? I think evidently <coughs> they came there to do that, but the Spirit of the Lord was with them and blessing them as they did that. That's what it seems to be. It's an active voice verb all the way through. All right, anything else? Okay, we'll stop there and take up with Lesson 24 on Sunday, the Lord willing.